Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Yoshi Kaneko from Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, thank you for joining CTSNet. We have a wonderful panelist today to discuss about transcatheter mitral valve repair versus replacement. Can we predict the future? Uh, first of all, you all know the panelists. These are famous people here. Uh, from the left, Dr. Wilson Zito from University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Michael Mack, as all we know, um, from Baylor, Dallas. And Dr. Gilbert Tang from Mount Sinai University in New York. Um, I would like to start opening the conversation here, and please feel free to chap, chap, chime in. Um, right now, there are a couple of transcatheter mitral valve replacement devices um, that are upcoming in clinical trials. Um, can you guys sort of describe what type of devices are out there, what are the problems that we're seeing, and your opinions on that? Wilson, if you, you want me to start? Yes, well, uh, it, well, certainly it's a privilege to be here. So thank you for an invitation to join this wonderful panel discussion. Uh, just a little bit of a background. Certainly transcatheter mitral valve replacement or TMVR is very early in its development and has gotten a lot of excitement, a lot of engagement, and I think that's important for our specialty as surgeons to be part of this yes. evolution of this treatment uh, process because I think it's very, very important. Right. Um, so I, I'm glad that there's so much interest seeing it at our level as, a sur as surgeons and also at our national meetings. Um, as I mentioned, TMVR right now is very early. Um, one pivotal study, the Apollo study, the Apollo yes. study has started, and that's the Medtronic device. Yes. Right now it is a transapical device, but certainly there are plans to move this towards transeptal. And, and then Mike, maybe Michael Mack can comment on a little bit. Well, there, are, there are other platforms now, but I, I think as a summary, just like any um, platform of development and research, there are going to be nuances and advantage and disadvantage of each device. So I don't think there's really one overarching theme that I think you can say is a problem with the therapy as a whole. Mike, you're one of the investigators, main investigators for the Apollo trial. Um, you've seen the devices and you've seen the videos of how it's done and the early clinical experience on that. Do you have any strong warnings against that that you see? So first of all, I would like to echo Wilson and say thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I would also like to start with something else that he said that, you know, surgeons are in the leadership here. Mm -hmm. and. Unlike the early days of TAVR, where some surgeons, such as Wilson and yourself, uh, Gilbert, embraced it, the majority did not. Mitral is our second bite of the apple here again, and I would right. encourage all our surgery listeners to jump in with both feet and let's help all figure this out together as part of the heart team. That being said, I think that the target uh, disease uh, for replacement uh, is going to be secondary mitral regurgitation. Right. Um, I think all devices and all trials are, are having a difficult startup time for multiple reasons. One is trial design to begin with. Two is the profile of the devices. Some mm -hmm. devices are more in the ventricle, some are more in the atrium. Mm -hmm. um, Thirdly, there's a limited number of sizes. So the screen failure rate in no matter what trial, and the three ongoing right now are Apollo, which is the Medtronic Intrepid, uh, Cardiac Q, which is the Edwards trial, and the Abbott Vascular Tendine trial, all have high screen failure rates uh, for those reasons, as well as the Neo LVOT. Uh, that is a huge issue with this, and I think an impediment, but this is the reason we do trials, to figure out the right patients, the right patient selection, mm -hmm. um, which anatomies are going to allow us to, to but it's, this is not TAVR redux. Uh, right. This is much more complex. So we're dealing with completely new different platform rather than putting a TAVR valve in a mitral position. Is that what you're saying? Like, Correct, but uh, we do that too, though, we as you well know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes yeah. we do. That's that, right. Oh, by the way, we do that too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, Gilbert, so you've been involved in mitral clip pretty heavily. So, you know, these new transcatheter mitral valve repair devices that are coming, um, can you comment on that? You know, what kind of devices and what do you think is going to be the prospect of these repair devices? Right, so first of all, thank you again for the invitation to attend this uh, STEAM panel. I think this is going to be a very interesting uh, juxtapose between repair versus replacement. 
I think first of all, co-op, the results are going to be probably presented at TCT later this year on functional MR. And if it's positive and it gets approval, it's going to be interesting to juxtapose functional MR undergoing mitral clip versus undergoing one of those TMVR trial. Because as we know, one of the limitations of the repair devices right now with mitral clip is the residual MR. Right. I mean, it's not completely addressed versus TMVR device, the data there virtually is no MR. Mm -hmm. So is that going to be one of the important endpoints that we will look at, or is it going to be something else? On the repair side, I think certainly it's got a uh, few fumbles, but I think it's starting to pick up steam. You know, certainly Edwards had now acquired CardioBand mm -hmm. and with Pascal, and certainly we bit loaded, uh, ba recently Boston Scientific has put an investment in Millipede. So clearly there's an uptake in interest in repair devices. I would say that in the repair space, what will happen, and it's already happening in Europe, is that combination therapy. Just like what we do in mitral repair. We do anoplasty, but some kind of leaflet, uh, repair or edge to edge, so it'll be very similar on the repair side. The difference is that it's likely going to be staged rather than simultaneous therapy. So, meaning that there could be aneuplasty uh, therapy first. If there's recurrent out, you might try to clip or vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, or a repair device, like an aneuplasty device, if it's anatomically feasible, could be a docking station for replacement device. So, again, I think repair devices could be, as long as you preserve all the options out there open and transcaptor repair replacement could be a potential game changer. But, you know, repair replacement device right now, even transafical are relatively easy to perform, unlike repair device, which can be more difficult because they're mostly transeptal based and it's anatomically more challenging. I want to open up to the panels a little bit more here, but, um, you know, the, the cardiologists are sort of dominating the mitral clip right now with the transcaptor mitral valve repair device that is only out on the market they have really done any mitral valve repair surgeries. Do you think we should be doing them? Do you think we should be the one that drives that, you know, multi-technology repair? So the short answer is heck yes, <coughs> for, for multiple reasons. So um, all our mitral clip procedures are done by a heart team, surgeon and a cardiologist together. Um, <coughs> and I've said this in front of a cardiology audience, so I'm not afraid of saying it, surgeons pick it up much quicker. Uh, uh, than uh, cardiologists do mm -hmm. because they're used to looking at 3D echoes, they're used to looking at X-plane, um, and they look at the mitral valve every day. Yeah. So, so they can translate three-dimensionally mm -hmm. what they're seeing so much better. Second reason is <clears throat> the access right now is predominantly transapical, yes. but don't let anybody delude themselves. It's going to stay there. It's going to go to transeptal. So you know what? Surgeons need to have the transeptal skills mm -hmm. because that's where this role, this world is going. Wilson, you agree with that? I, I could, yeah, I, I could not disagree with him anymore. I mean, this is absolutely right. I agree. I mean, it's, I think it's of paramount importance that surgeons remain very engaged in this and uh, and be true partners. Right. Not, yeah, I'll be there just to watch in and out maybe access or, or, or bail out, mm -hmm. but serve as true partners uh, who will work in a genuine relationship. That is a true collaboration. There are value uh, assets that we bring to the table. As, as Mike mentioned, we see the valve, we're, we're, we're comfortable with the valve, and frankly, lessons learned from mitral valve repair, from open techniques that we're very familiar with over the last two, three decades, that type of knowledge can and should be translated into catheter-based therapy. Right. So absolutely, we are, a we are definitely a value partner and we need to absolutely stay engaged. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting that uh, most recent mitral clip data, the surgeon involvement has been relatively flat, you know, since approval versus the cardiology uptake. And I think one of the issues that they, not necessarily they don't uh, feel engaged, but they maybe have a very busy clinical practice and they're not able to schedule themselves in, in the cath lab to work with the cardiologist. So my advice has always been, if you get referred a case that you feel is appropriate mitral clip candidate, get involved. I mean, that's the first step. And also companies have educational 
tools and courses on transeptal access. I mean, I put the analogy, it's like cannulating, you know, for, for open heart surgery. You can't cannulate, you can't do open heart surgery. Same thing for transeptal. Once all these devices come across, you need to use that basic skill to be able to uh, participate. But I don't think you should fall into the story, I'm too busy right. To, right. To, to, to do this. Absolutely, I agree. If you feel that you're too busy to do this, mm -hmm. wait 10 years. Right. You aren't going to be busy anymore. That's right. <laughs> okay? exactly. This world is changing and it's going to pass you by. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I think we've made a lot of mistakes, but one of the things we've done right is we have surgeons on the front line with cardiologists in multi-specialty valve clinics. We have an aortic clinic. We have a mitral clinic that now includes tricuspid. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to actually spin it out as a tricuspid clinic. But Surgeons, you got to be out of the operating room. You got to have the white coat on. You got to be in clinic. Otherwise, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, you're going to be, you're either at the table or on the menu. Right. You know what? Right. <laughs> exactly. Unless you're at the table, you're going to be on the menu pretty That's quick right. here. That's this right. ain't too hard to figure out. Yeah. We've seen this already. Correct. And I would also add, it, it, it's it's a change of culture, and time takes it takes time. Um, and I would say to to, to our members. Uh, it goes down to the foundation of education. I, I would say that similar to what the vascular surgeons have done mm -hmm. as they transform into a disease management specialty. Right. We need to do the same thing. And our educational processes, even to at the, at the, low, at the earliest beginning level of training, i.e. residents, mm -hmm. that, that mentality and that culture has to change. We have to get our residents into the cath labs mm -hmm. Um, demonstrating to them that this is what new cardiac surgery is going to be. It's part of the culture. Right. They need to learn those skill sets. I would love to see a day where our training program mirrors vascular surgery. No vascular surgeon ever says, I'm done with my training. I need to go do a year of endo. Right. It is built into their training. They're a so, great teacher for us. Correct. We have a tremendous opportunity, especially with the integrated programs, or those type of training, catheter base, can be somewhat integrated into some general basic tr uh, training foundation. So now we've put TAVR for the first time as you have to have experience as primary operator for TAVR in order to sit for your boards now. Exactly. So that's the first toe in the water in mm -hmm. terms of beginning to integrate it into our training. And it can't happen fast enough. You know, the other thing I would say is that the, you know, there's inevitably turf wars. I don't think they, you know, Correct. they were like they were in the early days. But when a cardiologist says, I don't need a surgeon there, or a surgeon says, I don't need a cardiologist there, the programs that are most successful are programs like yours in which the cardiologists and surgeons work well together. It's mm -hmm. the key to a successful program. I mean, that's shown in the TBT registry. I mean, in terms of the outcome, the team-based approach who are both leadership with surgeons and cardiologists, they have better outcomes. Correct. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's as I said, true partnership. Mm -hmm. It's mutual respect for each other uh, with the overall goal that we're going to help our patients. Yes. I think that's the uniting uh, principle. And when you tr uh, keep that in mind, most, not all, I understand it, this world's not that black and white, most of the financial and political issues should resolve themselves. Granted, there are exceptions, but I think if you keep that goal in mind, that's you're starting off in the right um, first step. So a surgeon just has to have an open mind for this new, new technology that's coming. You know, people have a lot of interest, but um, I think, you know, they really have to sh dive in and play the game. And any tips on how to do that? I mean, you know, people can say that you're very interested, but um, how should we prepare? It's coming. You know, the trials are starting. But what can we actually do? Um, you guys have mentioned several things, but um, you know, if you have any good tips or pointers. Well, I think to, to Mike's point, I think setting up the foundation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a physician, a surgeon who doesn't have the skill set, ideally you would have the skill set. But I think more important is setting the foundation of the heart team. I think that's the very, very first step, and you got to get buy-in from your organization uh, at every level. Um, if you have the skill set already, that makes that second step transition a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. But without it, you're going to have to show some true commitment that you're going to spend time and get those skill sets. Ideally at your local institution, but if not, you just may have to make a commitment to go somewhere else. I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a change in culture and it's a change in attitude. 
if you really step back and look at it, this whole emerging field of transcatheter valve therapy, mm -hmm. who are the inventors of all these devices? Surgeons. 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 Yeah. Surgeons. Okay. <laughs> all right. So you mentioned uh, Millipede just sold. Mm -hmm. Steve Bowling invented yeah. Millipede. Yeah. Jim Gammy invented Harpoon. Harpoon. Yes. Who, who's the original patent holder for MitraClip? I don't know. Good I don't know. Mehmet Oz. Mehmet Oz. Yeah. Oh, really? That's yeah. right. <laughs> That's right. So, That's right. so it's changing the attitude yeah. of thinking right. even on that right. level. Uh -huh. You know, you're not inventing yourself out of business. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you're moving the world forward in, 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 in the interest of best patient care. Yeah, and I think to your point is that you're now treating disease-based entities, not procedural-based entities. So you're treating multi disease. And I think if you come with that mindset, you got to offer the best therapy for the patient. In a competitive environment, you got to win because you offer the comprehensive uh, you know, options to, to your patients. You know, Gilbert, you mentioned the, the, the COAP trial. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, took four and a half years to enroll. Right. Painful trial, but right. one mm -hmm. thing that I learned out of that medical therapy really does work. Yeah. Yes. You know yeah. what? You yeah. don't have to offer these patients a procedure. Right. Mm -hmm. It does work. And right. oh, by the way, resynchronization therapy works right. too. Yeah. You right. know? I think what it points out though is mitral valve surgery, as you said, or mitral disease, as you said, it's much more complex mm -hmm. and heterogeneous than aortic stenosis. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really early at this point. But eventually, we have to be more sophisticated, just like with TAVR or aortic valve management, about the different nuances of DMR, FMR. Sometimes they don't fall that neatly into each bucket. Yeah. Uh, and it really does require the expertise mm -hmm. of the entire heart team, including heart failure specialists, because that certainly has a role. We know that. Yeah. So yeah. let me um, let me turn the tables here and interview the interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Yoshi, yes. you know, um, <clears throat> your eyes are wide open in this field, and you've got a, a, a long runway, a longer runway than I do ahead of me Maybe uh, a for the rest of my career. Yes. Fast forward ten years, how how do you see the mitral valve space? What do you see yourself doing? What do you see the disease treatment being? I actually foresee that surgery is still going to be there. There is no doubt that surgical mitral valve surgery will remain because it is hard to beat a good mitral valve repair, especially for degenerative disease. For functional disease, I think we are going to see more and more transcatheter procedures being done. And I personally see myself hopefully being more engaged in that field and more and more surgeons, you know, just like the leaders that we have as a panelist today, being sort of the leaders in that field and bringing that field forward. Surgeon lead. Mm -hmm. I think this session can go on forever, but um, for the sake of time, we do have to stop right here. Wilson, Mike, and Gilbert, thank you very much for joining today. I think we had a great session, and we would love to see what the future is like.